On this episode of Doing the Most, we're tackling the topic of balancing meats and wines. Homemade brews and various artus, everything from meat to roast. Big creation, fermentation, and heat creation, doing the most. The more I talk about balance in our homebrewing videos, the more questions I see on our community pages and in our Instagram DMs about how to balance wines and meats. And what I really see is people with very specific problems asking questions about what can solve those. And then of course we've also had folks write in and ask us if we can just do an episode on how to balance wines and meats. And so I was trying to think about the best way of going about this. And the other day, I came up with this little experiment that you can do at home in order to work on balancing your wines and meads. First, it's important to talk about what balance is. And in a wine or a mead, you have five basic components, your alcohol and your water, and your alcohol should be balanced for the style, and your water should be good water or properly amended water so that you don't have any off flavors coming from the water. And if you're making like a traditional wine, like a grape wine, the water flavor is in the juice that you get from the grapes. So presumably in an all grape juice wine, the water would be filtered up through the plant and into the grapes, thus eliminating some of the water quality issues that you might experience. But on the home brewing scale, when you're making a wine, typically you are mixing some grape juice concentrate with water. Or when you're making a mead, obviously you're mixing honey and water together. And so you want good tasting water for that balance. But like I said, there are five main components. There's the water and the alcohol, but there's also sugar, acid, and tannin. And for the new home brewer, this experiment that you can do at home will help you to build your palate for balance and flavor profiles. But you're gonna need a cheap bottle of wine. This is a Chardonnay from California. And then of course, you're gonna need quite a few vessels to run this experiment. I've got mason jars here and you're going to need a few ingredients. Sometimes you can tell how delicious a wine is gonna be by the quality of the packaging. Just smelling the cork, I can smell a little bit of acid in there. There's some floral notes, a little bit of fruit, apple, pear, that sort of thing. Pretty basic standard table wine. So we're gonna start by pouring a few vessels, one of which is going to be our control, which will get no amendment whatsoever. And then one mason jar is gonna be labeled as our variable. This is the one that's going to get all the things. And then thirdly, we're gonna pour the glass that's going to be for tannin. And I'm pouring this one first and now because it needs to sit for a bit. To amend tannin in this experiment, we're gonna go real simple and we're gonna use a cold brew black tea. So this should need about five minutes. Nothing like a good glass of tea to wake you up in the morning. So tea is basically tannin in leaf form. Tannin is the quality of astringency, first and foremost, but also a quality of body. And typically in wine or meat making, your tannin is gonna come from stems, seeds, and skins. Some people will use raisins for tannin. It does provide some tannin. Some raisins have stems. Obviously they all have skins. But typically in winemaking, when you're making an amendment for tannin, you're just gonna use powdered wine tannin. Powdered wine tannin is typically made from the stems and skins of grapes. And also a lot of times it will have a chestnut extract added to it to provide some soft tannin. Powdered wine tannin looks like this. This is about a pound of powdered wine tannin, and it's literally just a powder. It mostly dissolves into solution and takes between a week, but usually up to about two weeks to do its thing when you add it. And so a lot of folks will add some at the beginning, and that's helpful because it does help aid in clarification of the wine or mead. Like I said, tannin can help build body. And if you watched our recent hydromel videos, I added quite a bit of tannin to the hydromel recipes because there's so little body in there. The only ingredients basically are honey and water with a little bit of acid adjustment in the crispy honey hydromel. And in the fruited ones, even though there was fruit puree added, it still needed a little bit of body to round out the palate. And that's something that tannin can provide. It can provide that sense of fullness or roundness on your palate. Now, if you go overboard, it can be puckeringly astringent 
and really get you kind of right in here and it can be an unpleasant sensation. Oftentimes you can get that sensation from like maybe an over oaked wine. If a wine has sat on oak too long, it can sometimes absorb too many tannins and especially if there are not a lot of vanillins that have been absorbed, it can taste pretty astringent, pretty bitter and sharp and unbalanced. And that's why I like to, when I'm doing recipe development, add a little bit throughout the progression so I can get a sense of where the balance is at. And again, it takes a couple of weeks on average for tannin to do its thing. So you really wanna add it and wait and let it leach into your wine or mead so that way you know what's up with it. A spot of tea. Sugar is simple. And here I'm just using table sugar for this experiment because you all probably have it at home. So for our third group, the acid group, we have a few options. And some of these you may not have on hand, particularly if you're a newer home brewer, because sometimes these kinds of supplies just kind of accumulate as you continue trying new things or branching out to different brews. I just happen to have some of these things around, and so I can kind of show you the world of what they look like. Citric acid I actually have on hand because I used to be really into cheese making, and uh, you need it sometimes for certain kinds of cheeses. This is pure citric acid, and citric acid is the primary acid in things like lemon and lime juice. And so if you don't have access to citric acid or any other type of acid, you could substitute lemon juice or a squeeze of lime juice in this experiment. That said, they are gonna carry some flavor over. So if you can get your hands on citric acid, which is usually in the baking aisle of your grocery store, go with that. It's also great to put a little pinch in some water for a nice refreshing summer beverage. So for this experiment though, I'm gonna use malic acid. And my malic acid is stored in a mason jar but typically it's sold in bags just like the citric acid. Malic acid is a real common acid in things like apples. Citric acid has kind of a bite or a twang to it. Think about lemon or lime juice. Malic acid has a rounder and almost softer edge to it, like an apple. Think about biting into a lemon versus biting into an apple and what that acid profile feels like on your tongue. That's how these acids taste differently. Wine grapes have citric and malic acid in them, as well as tartaric acid, and of course, quite a few other acids. And there's a bacterial culture called a malolactic fermentation culture that can actually convert malic acid into lactic acid, which is a soft acid. And lactic acid gives a really smooth sensation on the palate. It's the same acid that's predominant in dairy products. We're gonna use malic acid because I like the profile of malic acid and I don't want this to be super pungent. And I don't particularly care for sour wines. This isn't gonna make it as sour. What we're creating here is some measured amounts that we can use for very light adjustments. And so while, while I put a whole gram in here, we're actually gonna be making our adjustments minutely with spoonfuls. So a splash into both of these. And obviously this isn't super scientific. If we were say attempting to balance a mead or a wine live, we would be measuring everything, all of it. So now that we have all of our components, it's time to taste our control group. This is an incredibly dry wine. There are a lot of apple and pear notes in there. Same that I was getting from the, the nose off of the cork. It is fairly astringent and the acid profile is sharp. And a sharp acid profile with a softer fruit like an apple or a pear running around in that flavor profile definitely makes it feel unbalanced. It feels like there is something off kilter about the flavor profile where it needs to feel rounder and in a sense it needs to feel more acidic it just needs to feel acidic in a different way and so i think malic acid might be an interesting choice for this and when you're doing this experiment at home i would suggest doing this with a variety of very cheap store-bought wines maybe over the course of a few weeks not in one night and I would talk to the wine expert at your grocery store or liquor store to ask them for some dry and kind of medium to low bodied wines that you can play with. 
and let the wine expert know what you're doing. They'll probably be super curious about it and curious to hear your feedback once you're done kind of playing with the flavor profiles in these. So it's a basic wine. There's no sweetness. Uh, it's very dry. So I'm going to add a little bit of the sugar to the variable group. And while I'm at it, add a little bit of the acid solution. I'm not going to touch the tannin just yet. Already this one smells much different. <laughs> uh, it's hard to detect things like this in the nose of it, but it definitely has an aromatic, less pungent kind of air sitting on the top of the wine. It's weird. I weirdly like that quite a bit more. I think it could even still be sweeter. And now that the malic acid is kind of cutting through on there, the astringency has actually dropped and it's less puckering and less jarring up in here. I'm gonna add a, a touch more acid, a touch more sugar, and a little bit of our tannin solution. I didn't like this white to begin with. And while I will say that this isn't necessarily markedly better, it's more interesting. And maybe what I'm really trying to say there is it's more complex, which means that I'm feeling a lot more things going on in my palate and I'm sensing a lot more things as I take the wine in, wash it over my palate, swallow and exhale. I'm picking up on more pops of flavor and sensation than I did with the original control. Palate cleanser. I probably went a little too hard on the malic acid, but this is a much more interesting flavor profile. I think diluting it some and then adding a little bit more of our tannin solution and we'll have something. Now the tea is starting to come out just a little bit and so I'm getting a little bit of that flavor. That's partly why I don't recommend tea as a tannin amendment because the tea does carry with it some of its own flavors. But this is actually really good. I'll probably go drop an ice cube in here and polish this one off with an episode of The Mandalorian. So as you can see, these three components, sugar, tannin, and acid, are something that you can adjust. You can adjust kind of with things from around the house. If you wanna go the more scientific, more direct route with it, you can go straight to the source and get pure acid or powdered wine tannin. And if you wanna play with profiles, instead of back sweetening a wine with table sugar, you might play around with brown sugar or with a grape juice concentrate that has sugar in it, or even with honey and make a pseudo mead. And with meads, you might play around with back sweetening with different kinds of honey to impart different subtle flavors in your back sweetening process. Now tannin, like I said, kind of needs to be adjusted throughout. Acid and sweetness can be adjusted right up to bottling day, but be careful. If you are back sweetening or acid adjusting an entire batch, you risk screwing up an entire batch. So what some folks will do is draw off a measured amount, weigh that, weigh all of the amendments, and then do the math from that to scale up to the whole batch. So that way, if they lose anything, it's in their graduated cylinder, not in their carboy or keg. It's not easy to build a palette for flavor, and it's particularly difficult to build a palette for astringency and roundness and the subtleties between different acid profiles but playing around with an experiment like this where you're just taking a $6 bottle of wine and seeing how the different flavors play will help you start to build an understanding of like, oh, this is, this is missing roundness. This might need more tannin. Or this tastes sharp, but not super acidic. I wonder if I could add a rounder acid like malic acid or a softer acid like lactic acid in order to smooth around this out. And you'll start to kind of understand and get a sense for 
how these things interplay. And for a newer home brewer, you might just wanna rely on the balance of your honey or of your fruits or of your grape juice as you continue skill building in the world of home brewing. But if you're wanting to start leveling up to an intermediate level, playing around with sugar, tannin, and acid to understand how they affect the flavor profile of your brews is gonna help you edge to that next level of really understanding how to not just brew something good, but brew something great. We'll probably do more in this tackling topic series, but I hope this experiment or thought exercise kind of helps those who have been asking questions about balance or who are curious about the elements of balance but have no clue where to start, form a basic understanding of how these things might be done on the home scale. I would suggest buy yourself some powdered wine tannin, buy yourself one different kind of acid. If I was gonna to have to suggest one, I would say malic acid. I think malic acid is one of the most underappreciated acids in home brewing and play around with it. Just play around with it and experiment. That's the whole point of the hobby is to play around with it and have some fun. If you have questions, which I'm sure you do, throw them in the comments. I'll try to answer what I can. And I encourage others to dip into the comments. If you have great insight or advice on how to balance things and can answer folks' questions, please do. I love it when the comments are a great resource of information for folks when following up after watching one of our videos. As always, you can find us on Instagram and Pinterest at doing the most okay. Our website is doingthemost.org. Do you have ideas for other topics to tackle? Let me know in the comments. Thanks, and until next time, stay safe.